So it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker, my partner in crime. Um, he's more criminal than I am, um, Dr. Bailo, who's going to be talking about uh, some research aspects of the disease. All right, so thank you. Uh, great, so, so um, this has been a really informative day, I mean a great, a great day, morning and afternoon. Um, I would like to just comment quickly to say that in Stephen Hawking is, is definitely not defined by his disease and I know that actually because less than a year ago he came here, uh, we actually also run the ALS Center, and he came here to uh, talk to us about stem cell research. And he actually sat in this room and gave a lecture uh, for an hour. Uh, and we learned a lot about black holes that we did not know, and I still do not know. Um, and then afterwards, we went over to, uh, to the Capitol Grill, and he had margaritas with us. Uh, I, I'm two. kid you not, two, absolutely. And uh, there was nothing about him that, that his disease defined him, and uh, I, I, I completely agree. Um, <clears throat> so I've been tasked to give a research update, and, and this topic is very broad. Um, so I'm not going to try and cover every bit of research that's going on in CMT. I'm going to try and give you just one story, really, about what's going on in, in my lab, uh, because that's what I know the most about. Um, and we can talk about other research things as we go. As Pat told you, there are research programs going on in 1A and 2A and 1B, um, and each of those could take up more than an hour of lecture. So that's unfortunately not the goal. I, as, as I said, I'll just try and give you a flavor of what's going on, and I think it's kind of an interesting story. Um, so, let's see, do I use this thing? Yes. So the first thing I want to point out, this is a picture of us from last night. Uh, some of those are actually already on this, uh, in the room or on this slide. Um, and that's uh, Irina over in the corner there. So, let's see, there we go. Uh, and she's actually in the back of the room there. Uh, she's one of the researchers in my lab doing this project. And this is Kevin. He's uh, partially blocked here. He's also doing that. So, all the work that you're going to see today uh, has been done mostly by these two folks and then several others in the lab. Um, <clears throat> and here they are trying to uh, explain what they were doing last night as well as quiz people on stuff, something about Nobel Prizes or something, I don't know, um, if any of you were at the quiz. So this, of course, has already been, this point has been made. Um, this is in massive scale, but this is, you know, a nerve. Uh, and that we have two major types of CMT, one that affects the Schwann cells here that, that form the wrapping or the insulation around the axons, which are the essentially electrical cables transmitting signals, uh, both to the muscles and then from uh, the muscles and skin, and then type two, which affects the axon primarily. Um, and of course, it's, it's not every nerve in the body that's affected for some reason. Now, this is a person who has demyelinating CMT, uh, actually has a PMP22 point mutation, it turns out. Uh, but it's the, ner this, the nerves that are the longest in the body. It's the ones that go to the feet and then the legs and later involving the hands, as was the first description, the Charcot's title of his paper. It's a, you know, a, a form of muscle atrophy which begins in the feet, progresses to the legs, later involving the hands, often familial. And that's pretty much all you need to know, actually, as a clinician. Half the time, you, that would be enough to describe it. Um, so it's kind of a mystery as to why the, these ones are affected because, as was pointed out earlier, even the, the, if you have the demyelinating form or any form, the nerves that are going to your face are also affected in a sense. They also have the genetic abnormality at the very least or probably have a Schwann cell abnormality, but it's the axons that are the problem. It's, the, it's these cables inside that fall apart as a consequence of the problem, in this case, say, the Schwann cell, and it's the ones that are the longest that are most affected. Um, and so, I think the next slide, that sort of brings up the point that we have several strategies to try and develop treatments for this disease. Um, and you heard a little bit about this. Drug therapies have two options, and we are working on all of these. Really, they can either improve the function of the myelin so that that problem just doesn't happen, or they can actually just protect the axons, so not fix the myelin problem, but just keep those axons intact. We kind of know that those things exist. There must be factors that protect those axons. Because, for example, some patients with CMT1 have a very severe early onset form, and then others are not diagnosed until their 70s. And they have the same gene defect. 
So there's some other genes or some other things in their environment that protected those axons. And we're actually working very hard to figure out what those are. Other options are things that you, you may have heard of in the past, gene therapy. Um, let's say we figure out what your gene is, we might be able to turn it down or turn it up and actually try and fix the problem that way. Um, and then the last thing is something called cell therapy. And actually it's really under-investigated, I would say, in this disease and, and in most diseases. This is really stem cell therapy, but, but any therapy where we're actually injecting a cell or using a cell to deliver something. And that concept is, is mostly to, let's say we could just replace the Schwann cells with new ones. Um, or replace the axons with new ones, which would be even a bigger challenge. Um, so what I'm actually going to talk about is the last one, which, as I said, is, is something that really has not been talked about very much in CMT. Um, so what we did was is we wrote a kind of a crazy grant to this organization called CIRM. Uh, this is, if you're from California and you pay lots of taxes, this is part of the reason why. Um, these, this is one of the good things, I suppose. And so this is the, uh, the stem cell agency that actually uh, was set aside $2 billion uh, nearly 10 years ago to help develop therapies for diseases using stem cells. And so I actually, you know, our group went after a piece of this money and, and squirreled away $3 million bucks actually to do this project. Um, and it was, uh, it's very exciting and it was great. It was one of the great things that happened by moving to California. I got an opportunity to be involved with this. So, um, the disease that we decided to focus on with this project that I'm going to tell you about is CMT1A. Um, and, and many of you know about this. Um, this is when you normally have two copies of a gene called PMP22. Um, they have a tendency actually to duplicate or contract. It's in a region of the genome that's very unstable. So sometimes when it gets replicated, you make an extra copy. And sometimes you contract and lose a copy. So in the case of CMT1A, you have one extra copy. And this one extra copy of the gene leads to first disruption of those Schwann cells. And this picture is, is, is interesting. What this seems to indicate is that these are Schwann cell basal lamina that are surrounding an area where there used to be an axon, really. And what happened was when this person was, you know, a year or two old, they tried once and then they failed to myelinate and then the Schwann cell died again. And then they tried again and then it fell apart. And this actually happened over and over again during their lifetime while the axon was still there. And then eventually, for some reason, because that keeps happening, the axons can't tolerate this anymore, and particularly the long axons, right, the ones that go to the toes, usually in someone's teenage years, but it can happen later, it can happen earlier. And when those degenerate, the muscles shrink and can't be controlled, and, and the feet become weak. Um, so let's see. So this was what we proposed to do. And actually, I even myself thought this was kind of crazy. And it might be. Um, and that was to, to, to make a model. And actually, I'm going to go through the whole thing first, and then I'm going to explain to you how it's sort of going. So basically, let's say I was going to take a CMT1A patient, and uh, I'm going to take their skin cells. I'm going to turn them into stem cells. I'm going to take those stem cells, and I'm actually just going to delete that extra copy. They didn't need that, because we don't want that. That's what's causing the disease. And then we're actually going to take those stem cells, we're going to turn them into Schwann cells again in a culture dish. Uh, and then, of course, it's probably a good idea to make sure this would work, so let's test this in animals. We can take the Schwann cells that we fixed over here versus the Schwann cells that we didn't fix over here and actually put them back into the nerves of a rat model. This, this is a rat model, actually, of CMT1A and see if these corrected ones will actually form normal myelin. This is what normal myelin looks like whereas we expect the ones that weren't corrected wouldn't. And if we can get that to work, does this mean that we could actually take these Schwann cells, or sorry, these skin cells from a patient, turn them into Schwann cells that are corrected, and then put them back into a patient? And so it, this is kind of crazy. I hope you guys said, Bob, that's crazy. <laughs> um, and it is a little bit. But actually, I thought this was fun because th much of this is actually achievable. And there are parts that we don't know. We, for example, don't know whether you know, injecting cells into people's nerves are going to work. But it's, that's not a great reason not to try it. Um, and that was the whole point of this project, is to say, let's, w will this work? And, and actually, what could come of it? And by the way, we're not going to take them out of the rats and put them back into the patients. That's a, that's a fault of the diagram. So <laughs> if anyone's paying attention. Um, 
So, unless you don't like the patient. Unless, well, no. So, first thing I want to talk about is this first step, right? So, first thing we've got to do is take skin cells and make them into stem cells. And five years ago, that was absolutely crazy. That, even the concept of doing that was crazy. Um, we did know then that there's something called embryonic stem cells, and you guys may know about those. This is a picture of how embryonic stem cells are actually made. You have to take an embryo, uh, usually from a, a, a fertilization clinic, much like you just heard about, and then you have to take some cells out of it, put them in culture. But it turns out if you culture those, you can then turn them into different types of cells. You've got neurons here, and you've got uh, muscle cells, and I think these are blood cells, or you can just keep growing them. And we knew that this was a really great potential source of tissues to use for treatments in disease. Let's say you wanted to regenerate a liver or a kidney or a nerve. Um, but of course, this came with a lot of problems, and that is that it has to be derived from an embryo. This embryo is not um, you. This embryo was somebody else. Uh, and so even if you took those tissues and transplanted them into a vigil, they would actually be not genetically matched. It wouldn't be much different from getting a liver from somebody else. Um, so there, there's a lot of great things that happen in this field. There still are. But something came along uh, that really has changed the way we think about disease modeling and as well as stem cell therapies. And so this is sort of the same picture. You know, you've got a sperm and an oocyte here. It turns into this blastocyst. These are the cells I just showed you, and they can become different cells. Um, but, in, I think there's a neuron there. But in about 2007, and, uh, and then about a year later in, in 2008, several groups, including Dr. Yamanaka's group, who was the main one, discovered something called induced pluripotent stem cells. And this is a, a technology whereby you can take cells from an adult patient. And remember that the DNA in every one of your cells here is the same as it was here. It hasn't changed, it's just which genes are being expressed determines as it goes through this whether it becomes a nerve cell or a, a heart cell. So they actually found that they can take skin cells and then they can stick in a series of genes to reprogram them. These are the same ones that it used to be expressed here or normally silenced and actually turn these back into something called induced pluripotent stem cells. So they are basically an embryonic stem cell that's derived from you while you're an adult. And this technology, um, I think I'll leave that out, basically allows us to reprogram any cell in the human back to an embryonic state. And then we could turn around and drive it forward again. We could make new tissues from those things. Um, and as I said before, if we took that cell from you and made a new heart, we could, in theory, transplant that heart back into you, it would be the same as yours, and you wouldn't need uh, to be immune suppressed like normal heart transplant patients. So this was very promising. And the other thing we could do is we could take these cells out, even if we couldn't manage to make transplanted hearts or nerves or anything else, we could actually take them from patients and we could actually model the disease. We could, if you have CMT and we want to know what's going on in your nerve or your spinal cord, you prefer that we not take a piece of that spinal cord out to figure it out in the lab, because then you're going to have problems, right? We're going to be taking out your nerves. So this is the only way we've actually been able to look at these tissues in patients who have nervous system diseases. So this is a real breakthrough, and, and this was awarded the Nobel Prize within six years of its discovery, uh, which is the fastest of any Nobel Prize. Uh, and so this was a big deal. So, oh, yes, there it is. So for those of you who came last night, I promised to show a picture of my pants, of me with my pants down. This, this picture, I hope I get to show it for many years, right? Because it's just going to get funnier and funnier uh, as I wear contacts more often now and my hair is somewhat shorter and, you know, Peggy makes fun of the way I used to dress. I mean, there's a beeper, you know. Yeah, for, for, yeah, <laughs> yeah all right, let's, let's, let's move on. So, so this, this is me getting a skin biopsy. That's how easy it is, right? So we can take, I actually have had three while we were trying to figure out how to work it. Um, we don't need to do that anymore. So, so this part, remarkably, is actually doable, it's been done. We've already made uh, patient IPS cells from four different CMT patients who I've had over the years uh, that we just kind of used as proof of principle models. Uh, and then you can say, well, what about this next part? You're gonna try and, and, and just get rid of one of these copies. That's, that's science fiction, you can't do that. Um, well, it turns out you can. Uh, so also within the last probably five years, We've developed a series of technologies to genetically manipulate these cells. 
And so what this is, is more of these gene sequences here, okay? These are actually from a patient with CMT, uh, and this is this, to schematically represent the three copies of PMP22, okay? This is the gene here, this is the start codon, so this is where the protein starts, then it makes the protein. So we designed something called a talon that actually sits down at specifically this DNA sequence at the start codon. And we went through a whole series of uh, manipulations, I won't even go through, but basically we were able to just knock out a small piece of one of the three copies. Um, and what that does is it shuts down that third copy. So we've actually done this. This is real data from a patient. Kevin in the lab has been working hard at this. And for two of the patients, we've already made isogenic cell lines, essentially, meaning they are their normal genome otherwise, but they've deleted the extra copy, made it functionally inactive. So, so we've done that. So we've actually gotten to here. Um, which again, using two technologies that just five years ago or seven years ago didn't exist at all. So, so what else can we do? Well, now we're feeling pretty, pretty optimistic, I guess. So let, now we have them in a dish, but they're stem cells. And I kind of showed you how they become different kinds of cells. We have to turn them into Schwann cells. So it turns out there is this, how we do this is we just re recapitulate development. So after you are those sort of, you know, say six cell embryos, you kind of turn into a ball. The ball kind of curves up, and then right at the top of it, there's this thing in the upper left-hand corner. And if that thing then invaginates upon itself to form this thing, it starts to almost look like something you'd know because this becomes the spinal cord. And then these cells above it are called neural crest. They wander out, and what they actually do is they wander along your nerves, and they form all the Schwann cells. Okay, so we, we've known this for a long time, so they start here, and then they become a Schwann cell precursor, they sit next to the axons, and then they eventually will either become two different types, non-myelinating or myelinating. This is the one we've been talking about. So we've got to drive these cells that are essentially earlier than this stage and turn them into this stage. Well, it turns out that's pretty achievable. The way we do that is we have a whole series of uh, cues that these cells normally receive. So, so the way this works normally is these cells kind of sit here and they say, all right, well, I'm here, and if, I, if I'm next door to this cell and I'm next door to this cell, it must mean I'm a, a neural crest cell. And we figure out what all those signals are, and we, in a series, in a dish, give them those signals. So they think they're going through development. And so what's on the next slide here is what that looks like. And these are actually what the cells look like. And so it starts out, these are actually more like IPS cells. They're sort of balled up, very small. And over time, you start to see coming from them these small other looking cells that are flatter. And then it sort of moved towards this stage. And this stage, we do a bunch of characterization of them. And they actually look like neural crest cells. So then, as I said, we got to get them to this stage. But we've got to drive them even further. We want to turn them into Schwann cells. So we're still playing with the best ways to do this. But it actually works relatively well. Um, and we've been able to, these are from two different patients develop Schwann cell precursors. It takes about 40 days from that first stage I showed you. Uh, and Irina knows all too well how the waits every one of those 40 days. You can see her back there. Um, there it takes a while, obviously. But you can generate these. They change in the way that they look. This is an actual human Schwann cell line here. So these were actually cultured from a nerve uh, gathered at autopsy from a patient. Um, so these are normal human Schwann cells. And we can actually show by a lot of methods, not just the way they look, that that's what they are. So, in fact, we've, we've gotten this far relatively well. And that's actually, I mean, not to blow our own horn, but we've only had this grant for about a year, so we're, we're doing okay. Um, so we're moving on to this stage, actually, and, and, and trying to see what happens, and this is a big unknown, really, is whether you can inject these cells into an animal model and have them sort of take in that setting to see if this proof of concept would work. And I'm not gonna show you some of the pilot data. We've, we've done some of these injections and, and it looks like we're able to get the cells in there. We're not sure if they're gonna form myelin yet. But I just wanna show you that this isn't that crazy. And in fact, that in other fields, they've gotten this far already. So in your brain, you have something called oligodendrocytes. Those are the Schwann cells of the brain. And the, the CNS people say that the Schwann cells are the oligodendrocytes of the PNS, but you know. People argue with each other, but so <laughs> oligodendrocytes are these myelin, they just produce myelin in the brain, okay? And this group 
uh, has actually shown that human iPS cells have actually been injected into a mouse model of congenital hypomyelination. This is a very severe form of disease. This would, in CMT, be equivalent to something called congenital hypomyelinating neuropathy. So at birth, there's really no myelin. In the brain, these are typically called leukodystrophies, if you've heard of those things. So there's an analogous group of diseases that happen in the brain. And what they showed is that they can take these cells, and what these green cells are, are actually are human iPS cell-derived oligodendrocytes. And they actually injected them into the brain, and they remarkably migrate throughout the entire mouse brain and start to myelinate axons. And this is just showing that they can actually keep these mice alive. These are a very severe mouse model. They have no myelin in the brain at all. But this is showing that if you put these in, it actually can support the survival of these mice a lot longer than they would normally live. So it's not that crazy. You could do this, potentially. Um, and then this actually is, is this has been done in humans. So these same types of cells, there's already been a clinical trial, it's a very small, where David Roich, who came and spoke here last year, took a series of patients who have a similar type of myelinating disease in the brain, and they've injected these cells into the brain. So, you know, it does sound a little crazy. The nerve's a little bit more challenging. You have a lot more nerves, and how would you get them in? But people said the same thing about squirting them into the brain. So um, I'm not sure which I would rather have. <laughs> Probably the nerve, I don't know. Um, but so this is, this is not totally nuts. And I think it's a direction which we should at least investigate whether it's viable. Um, so where, where to do such a thing? I mean, the, the building over there that you saw, some of you guys saw yesterday, is pretty exciting. And, and the sixth floor is, is uh, all the neurology clinics, which if you guys decide to visit, you'll see. And then on the eighth floor, actually, that's this one. On the eighth floor are the labs. That's where our labs are. And one of the missions that we have here is really to advance uh, alternative types of therapies, meaning stem cell therapies, meaning gene therapies, in small trials to actually see whether this will work. And uh, as an example of this, in ALS, we're actually working towards doing a, a similar trial. We've gotten a bit farther there. So Clive Svensson, who runs this Regenerative Medicine Institute, has developed a type of stem cell that we've actually planned and are, and are moving forward towards transplanting those directly into the spinal cord of patients with ALS. Um, and we've shown in that disease, we already put it in disease models, that it can protect those neurons. So this idea that an invasive neurosurgery you know, couldn't be done to actually treat a disease like this is not true. And you know, we're getting there. We haven't started the clinical trial. We're still sort of proving that we can do it safely. Um, but logistically, this is, this is not something that can't be done. And it's something that we need to look forward to as a possibility. So yes, yeah, so it's going to be a small trial, 18 patients. And we'll look forward to starting it hopefully in a year. <clears throat> So this is the whole picture. Um, can we get it to this stage right now? I hope so. Uh, we certainly are going to get here, whether it can protect these you know, animal models from disease, and then proof of principle, would it be worth going into patients? But what if all that fails? I mean, you always have to have a plan B. And let's face it, this is kind of a moonshot. Um, and we're kind of sending dogs into space right now, uh, or monkeys or whatever, right? I mean, but that has to be done. But what also we're going to learn from this is, is there's a lot more we can do with these cells. So we can take these cells from patients and we can try and build a nerve in a dish. Uh, and so this is some of Irina's work here where she took uh, this little chambered uh, slide essentially and you put neurons in this side and then you can put Schwann cells in this side. And you kind of see them shooting their axons over here. Um, and she then stained this, this neurofilament. So this is like little nerves in a dish. You can kind of see them almost like coming out of a spinal cord. And these, this is the side over here where we have Schwann cells. And these two lonely Schwann cells over here, um, there actually are many more, but are actually forming myelin around some of these nerve structures here in a dish. So the concept behind this is that we could actually use this type of a platform and test drugs. Can we see if there are drugs that improve the myelin function? Uh, and then, then take those drugs back to patients instead of having to squirt all the cells back in. So even if this doesn't work at the sort of moonshot level, there's a heck of a lot we can do with them. And we've been planning to do it in parallel regardless. Um, so just quickly to show all the other cool stuff that we can do, this, we can actually uh, not just knock out that third copy of PMP22, um, but because we have this bad boy targeting this site, 
We can use that same thing and we can introduce an extra gene in there. Okay, so we've done this. We've actually uh, recently achieved this, which is we've put in uh, a copy of something called luciferase. It, tur it's a, it turns on a light. It's actually from fireflies. Okay, so we can use firefly technology. We have the power. Um, we don't have any of them here, by the way, in Los Angeles. And one of the big things I'd say I miss from the Midwest, right, is at least seeing fireflies in the spring. But that's, that's too bad. I get a lot of other stuff. Um, so, so we've actually done this. This is kind of neat. So there's different strategies. Actually, with the CMTA Star Network was trying a, an alternative strategy to do the same thing, where they stuck it at the back of one of these copies of the gene. This one's a different, but it essentially serves the same purpose because what this now is a person's cell who has two normal copies and a third copy that's spying on it. It's telling us whether that gene is being turned on, whether that third copy is being expressed. And we can then take that, those cells, put them into a, an assay like this, and then test drugs on them to see, okay, well, is something turning the light up or down to see which modulates PMP22 levels? So this actually is, is achievable. Um, and to give a final example, there's only a few more slides of, of, from another field again uh, of where this has been somewhat successful in using these stem cell models of patients to develop drugs is some work that we recently did in ALS. And we took four patients who have ALS and we actually did the same thing. We made their stem cells and they have this particular gene mutation, one of the most common ones, and we turned them into neurons, right? Because I said we could turn them into Schwann cells, we can turn them into neurons or other types of cells. And, and there it's the neurons that we're interested in. And actually an analogous approach is, is being taken for CMT2A because there it's the neurons and the axons that are the problem. And what we showed is that in fact in these patient cells, that's the ones on the right, there's a defect in them. And these are these big red dots are basically just chunks of RNA that should not be there. So it turns out that this gene mutation that they have acts in a very strange way. It makes these big hunks of RNA that sit in the nucleus and seem to damage neurons. So we said, aha, there's something wrong with these cells. That's the same thing that's wrong in the patients. Let's, we actually worked with a company called Isis, and we said, let's test a, a strategy. Let's make a drug that targets that region of sequence and degrades it. So here's the patient's cells where we, didn't, we treated them with a scrambled oligonucleotide, so a, sort of a control to make sure we're not doing something nonspecific. And here's two different drugs that are actually targeting that region and we basically get rid of all of these foci of RNA and correct the disease manifestations in a dish. So it's really, you know, an example of how, this is just graphs showing you the same thing, but the pictures tell everything. So this is an example of how one can take this strategy, make these cells, partner up with a company that has a valid approach, and test a therapy very quickly. Um, and this approach we're hoping is going to get into clinical trials in just a few years, um, if, if we're fortunate. Because of, so. I think that's the last slide. I wanted to thank again the people who actually did the work. Somebody who came on the tour last night did a great job of pointing out, uh, as I sort of stood around, he said, do you really know what's going on here? You know? <laughs> so I, I acknowledge that you know, I don't know as much as Irina and Kevin, but I, I know enough. Um, no, I hopefully know enough. And uh, so Irina and Kevin uh, did most of the work that you saw, as well as Ghulam Mohammed, who's a nerve surgeon in our lab, does all of the nerve surgeries, and everybody else who's taken part in that, um, and, and of course, our many funding organizations and collaborators. So I'll, I'll take any questions, and thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs>